you'll hear a man calling a catering company. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, five star caterers. Can I help you? Oh, yes. I spoke to you an hour ago about the arrangements for our end of term party. Oh, that's right. It's Mr. Saunders, isn't it? Actually, it's Sanders. That's S. A N D E R S. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just get that down correctly on the form. Okay, Mr. Sanders, sorry about that. No problem. Well, I've got the details you asked for, so I thought I should call you back quickly and book. Good. Let's fill in the form, shall we? Great. First of all, can you give me a telephone number? Somewhere where you can be contacted during the day. Yes, it's 445-6786. 445-6786. Okay. And do you have a number where you can be contacted outside of office hours? Well, I'm at work till late in the evening, so use the same number, and if I'm not there, you can leave a message. Thanks. I'll make a note of that. And how many guests shall I put down? Okay, that's changed. So instead of the figure I gave you before of 85, it's now only 50. It's much lower, I'm afraid, because a lot of people can't make that date. That's not a problem. Can you remind me of the date we'd set? Yes, it's the 25th of June. Okay, that's fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, did you have the chance to look at the tables on the website? Yes, I did. And I think the rectangular tables would be good, the long, thin ones. Yes, um, you could have two of those. The only problem is that they are for 24 people. So you'd only seat 48 people that way. And if you have 50 guests. Oh, I see what you mean. Two people have nowhere to sit. What about the square ones? You'd have the same problem with numbers. Usually, for 50 people, we find the round tables work well. Not the smaller ones, they only seat six people. The ones that seat ten, the large ones. So, do you think we should have five of those? I think that would work well. Okay, that's what we'll do then. Fine. And have you decided on the menu you would like? Yes, I think so. But I wanted to ask you we talked about having the three course meal with waiter service, but in the end, we thought it would be a bit too formal. So that leaves the buffet or the seven course banquet. How much is a banquet again? A hundred pounds a head. That's too much and too formal. The buffet is fine. Okay. So, I think I've got everything. We'd need a deposit of 50% of the total. Right. What's the total? Just a minute. Yes, it's 30 pounds a head times 50. So, that's 1,500 pounds. 50% of that would be 750 now, with the balance due another 750 on the day. Great. I'll call in tomorrow if that's okay. I can pay you the deposit then. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow then. 
Okay. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. A man wants to place an order by telephone for some office stationery. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man, and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press one. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is six nine two four double one. Six nine two four one one. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers?、Uh, no, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, okay. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John?、Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4. That is normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or Manila?、Um, we'll have the plain white, please.、Uh, but the ones with the little windows. Okay. One box A four white. Just the one box, was it? Um. On second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No. You can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right. We'll stick to white then. Something else, John? Yes. We need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are five hundred sheets to the pack. Right. Let's see.、Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So, can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Anything else that we can help you with? Um,、uh, let me think. What else do we need? Ah,、uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Yeah, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right, floppy disks. 
And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar then uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because I have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a lecturer and a psychology student asking for advice about research methods. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning. Now, what is it you want to discuss today? Good morning, Dr. Reed. This assignment you've given us is the first psychology experiment I've had to do, and I'm not sure where to begin or which steps to take. Well, conducting your first psychology experiment can be quite a complicated and confusing process. But just remember that like other sciences, psychology uses the scientific method and bases its conclusions upon empirical evidence. What do you mean by empirical evidence? Ah, well, empirical evidence is established by observation rather than theory. And the scientific method? Oh, yes. When conducting an experiment, you need to follow a few basic steps. I know the first step is to come up with a research question or problem. Yes, a question that can be tested. How do I find an appropriate question? I would suggest one of three methods. Firstly, you can investigate a commonly held belief or what we call folk psychology. I see. So I could examine the belief that staying up all night to study for an important exam can adversely affect test performance? That's right. In that case, you would compare the scores of students who stayed up all night with those of students who got a good night's sleep. I think I could do that. Well, alternatively, you might want to consider reviewing the literature on psychology. You know, published studies can be a good source of unanswered research questions. I'm sure you've read papers where the authors note the need for further research. So I would come up with some questions that remain unanswered? Correct. But there is a third source of ideas. Just think about everyday problems and then consider how you could investigate potential solutions. OK. Perhaps I could study various memorization strategies to find out which are the most effective. That's the idea. Next, you need to define the variables. You know, anything that might have an effect on the outcome of your research. Yes. I remember we learnt about that last week. Yes, that's right. Then you have to develop a testable hypothesis that predicts how the variables are related. 
for example, students who are sleep deprived will perform worse in an exam than students who are not sleep deprived. Exactly. Once you have developed a hypothesis, you must carry out background research. I can use books, journals, online databases, and websites. Yes, all of those. I covered the reasons for background research in last Friday's lecture, didn't I? What you have to remember at this stage is to take careful notes and generate a bibliography of your sources. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK, I've got that. Then I'm ready to develop an experimental design. Well, again, you have a choice. There are three basic designs and each has its own strengths and weaknesses. The pre-experimental design does not include a control group, so there is no comparison. What we call a quasi-experimental design does incorporate a control group, but there is no randomization, whereas a true experimental design has both control groups and random assignment to groups. You've also told us about standardization of procedures. Is this where that comes in? Being sure to compare apples to apples? Absolutely. Going back to your sleep deprivation example, the same exam would have to be given to each participant in the same way at the same time, etc. Got it. When selecting subjects, you need to consider different techniques. If you were to go through with your sleep deprivation experiment, you would need to ensure that your experimental and control groups were standardised, that is, all third-year accounting students, for instance. A simple random sample involves choosing a number of participants from a group of similar people. On the other hand, a different kind of study might involve a stratified random sample, where participants are randomly chosen from different subsets of the population. You mean subsets with distinctive characteristics, like age, gender, race, socio-economic status, and so on. Precisely. Then the next step is to actually conduct the experiment and collect the data. Then I have to analyse the data. I'll be dealing with the statistical methods for analysing data in next week's lecture. Oh, good. I guess all that's left then is to write up the data. Yes, communicating your results is important. And in the next couple of lectures, I'll be covering the format and structure of a psychology paper and tips for writing each section. Thank you, Dr. Reed. I feel much more confident in getting started now. Thank you for taking the time to see me. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk by a health studies lecturer on anxiety. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My talk today is on anxiety. Anxiety is something you've all experienced at some time in your life, so you'll know that it's an emotional condition in which feelings of dread, fear, and mental agitation predominate. However, what we call an anxiety state or anxiety neurosis or phobic state, they all mean the same thing, is characterized by anxiety reactions far greater than those normally expected for the circumstances, and these reactions may be severe and prolonged. This is the most common form of neurosis in westernized countries. Usually, normal anxiety decreases with repeated exposure to the feared situation, whereas a neurotic anxiety tends to increase. Gradually, the person is inclined to avoid the feared situation and views it with increasing dread. Sometimes there may be an inherited tendency for this, but usually environmental issues are more important. The individual may have been a worrier throughout life, and a stressful condition, just before symptoms set in, is common. Often there is a gradual build-up of anxiety, possibly for weeks or months before the ultimate break occurs. The precipitating cause is usually one of great significance to the patient, often related to personal events, such as bereavement, a breakup, threats to career, health, or personal integrity. What are the symptoms of phobia? Well, phobic states often develop into severe, crippling challenges that can be very difficult to overcome. The person develops a fear of certain situations. It's not uncommon to have one or more of these present at the same time. I'm going to name some frequent phobias and give you a description of their symptoms. Let's start with agoraphobia, which is when the person has an intense anxiety about venturing outside the safety of the normal home surroundings. It may be impossible for this person to ever go out alone. Their fear of public or open spaces is completely irrational, and they often end up leading very secluded lives. Claustrophobia, on the other hand, is a morbid fear of closed-in areas or places. If you see me taking the stairs instead of the lift, think about it. Am I trying to get more exercise? Or am I trying to avoid the confined interior of the lift? And I'm sure you all know people who are afraid of flying. Sometimes it's the fear of being enclosed in the aeroplane itself. And you can imagine how the cramped confines of airline toilets are really bad news for these sufferers. Now I'll move on to discuss social phobia, which, believe it or not, is more common in men. It's an acute anxiety that develops when they are in the presence of others. They feel self-conscious, apprehensive, and embarrassed. If attention, real or imagined, is focused on the sufferer, he becomes uneasy and may blush, stammer, or stutter. Some sufferers even develop tremors, shaking or trembling movements of a part or parts of the body. Or another very common sign of their extreme discomfort is that they perspire profusely on their palms, under their arms, or on their feet. That brings me to the last one that I want to mention today, and that is single phobia. And no, it's not a fear of lifelong bachelorhood. This one is actually precipitated by an acute aversion to dogs, cats, spiders, you may have heard of the term arachnophobia. Well, it applies specifically to spiders, but any single thing can basically cause a strong aversion. Snakes, frogs, mice, or rats, for instance. I can assure you the list is unlimited. You name it, and someone is sure to have a phobia about it. Some people are terrified of the dark, for example, and I'm not talking about young children here. You'd be surprised how many adults are afflicted in this way. Well, I see our time is up. Next week I'll go into some of the treatments and therapies for phobias that have been used over the ages, 
and some of the relatively new drugs that have recently come on the scene. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.